Okay, so good morning uh, to all. Welcome to this uh, fifth day of the Entitled Summer School. And uh, orig the, in the original plan, as you all know, we had also uh, Catherine Gibson, uh, but um, uh, she's sending her uh, sincere apologies. She has her mother uh, hospitalized, uh, her 94 years old mother hospitalized, and she has to uh, take care of her. And uh, so she also had to cancel her video conference, uh, but luckily we have here uh, two very uh, good colleagues of uh, mine, uh, Ceren Özselçuk and uh, Nuket Sirman from the Department of Sociology here at Boğaziçi University. Uh, I was a student of Nuket Sirman some 18 years ago, uh, <laughs> so I'm very... <laughs> Uh, and I'm very glad that uh, we have them here with us and I'm sure we will have a very good uh, discussion. So the uh, theme of the day uh, is feminist perspective and transformative politics in Turkey. Uh, and uh, what we will uh, try to do is, so I will just tell you about the plan for the session. Uh, we will have Nuket first presenting a bit uh, her first paper, and uh, then uh, we will have a general discussion. This is why we have this uh, like kind of organization with the chairs. And then she will also present the second paper of hers, and then another discussion, hopefully, uh, we'll have, uh, and then we'll have the coffee break. Then Jeran uh, will be presenting basically what uh, they have been doing uh, with Catherine Gibson. So it is more like uh, a research agenda based on uh, Gibson's uh, work, but also uh, like kind of uh, <laughs> Um, future uh, research agenda. Uh, and then we will have the third paper uh, and a discussion again with Nuket uh, Sirman. So let me first introduce you uh, uh, Ceren. Uh, Ceren is an assistant professor of sociology here at Boğaziçi University in, in Istanbul and uh, her research fields include post althusserian theories of political and political economy, uh, psychoanalysis and subjectivity. Uh, she is a member of the editorial board of the journal Rethinking Marxism, where she has also worked as a managerial editor since 2012. And uh, she is currently working together with Yahya Madra on a book manuscript titled, uh, titled Sexuating Class, a Psychoanalytical Critique of Political Economy. And uh, Professor Nuket Sirman. Uh, <laughs> Nuket Sirman is a professor of anthropology uh, here at the Department of Sociology. She has conducted research on family farms producing cotton in the west of Turkey, on the rise of the feminist movement in Turkey in the early 1980s, on the construction of gendered citizens at the turn of the 20th century, on honor crimes and suicides in Diyarbakır in 2007, and on building a life after forced migration in Mersin in 2010. Um, and uh, she has also been a feminist activist since 1980 and has edited and published in non-academic feminist journals such as Amagri, Feminist Politica and Feminist Yaklaşımlar. She has also been part of the Women's in Initiative for Peace since 2009 and since 2013 participating, participated in monitoring the progress of the peace process in Turkey. So, uh, thanks for being with us today, and uh, the floor is yours, Nuket Hoca. Uh, thank you very much, Lidia. Do I need that? I think so, yes, because we have this video recording. Oh, okay. First of all, I would like to apologize for coming at this late time of the, um, of, of the workshop, uh, but this is the end of term, and I have many administrative duties. Uh, therefore, I had to be, you know, I had to, f to, you know, go to meetings and, you know, do horrible things. And, 
uh, and uh, I couldn't be here. I'm very, very sorry about this because there were some very important piece, um, you know, discussions that I would like, I would have liked to be part of. Uh, so uh, I apologize uh, for this. Um, okay, so uh, as uh, Begum said. I'm a feminist anthropologist and an activist, and in Turkey we have very interesting discussions about what it means to be an activist and what it means to be an academic. Uh, and I'm trying to sort of kind of bridge the two. Um, and uh, since 2009, I've been um, I mean, I, I've been part of this Women's Initiative for Peace. Um, there is one more person here, she's hiding behind somewhere there, Jan Su, who's also part of the Women's Initiative for Peace. I thought there would be somebody else here from, from our group, but she, she's not here. Um, we came together because in 2009, the Turkish uh, state uh, security forces began to uh, take under custody uh, numerous Kurdish women activists who had been working in um, Kurdish uh, towns and also in Istanbul where there are lots of Kurdish immigrants, uh, forced migrants actually, um, uh, and where there is quite a lot of um, so violence against women. And uh, the women's movement of the Kurdish political movement is a very active, very important group. Uh, uh, I mean, and they are kind of, they were at that time in 2009, they were totally, they were semi-autonomous from the Kurdish movement. As of 2015, January, they're completely autonomous from the Kurdish political movement, but in terms of their ideology and in terms of their um, sort of uh, general perspectives, they are part of the movement, obviously. Uh, so these women were working to empower Kurdish women and they were taken under custody. And that kind of sprang us into action because many of us had been working with them, trying to deal with issues on honor and trying to sort of work on notions of um, uh, crime against women, honor crimes, you know, this uh, type of thing. So. Um, so we, uh, we, uh, we thought that this was a kind of action against the empowerment of Kurdish women. I mean, we didn't take it necessarily as simply a political act trying to stop the Kurdish movement, but we saw it as a way of um, keeping, uh, trying to keep um, sort of Kurdish society in the state that it was, uh, the Turkish state or the Turkish sort of general ideology uh, stance defined the Kurds as backwards, barbarians, tribal kind of uh, people, etc., uh, etc. Et so, um, so we came together to say that um, this uh, kind of action was an act of war, that acts of war were not simply uh, done with uh, weapons or with, with actual sort of firearms, but that there were other ways of fighting against a particular group of persons, an, uh, a way of life, a way of being. And um, we, we, uh, we, so we wanted to understand the uh, parts, the, the bits about war that does not get talked about. Uh, the bits about war that have to do with um, uh, life, culture, thought, emotions, affect, you know, all these things. So um, we sent out a, 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 a kind of a call to women uh, from the general sort of opposition, leftist groups and, you know, sort of various opposition groups, and said, uh, we, have, we are having a forum in Diyarbakir, which is like the uh, capital of the Kurdish regions, or this is how the Kurds think about it. and. Um, and many women came. In fact, we ended up with a listserv of 400 people. Um, and uh, these people came from very different political perspectives. And they had very, very different definitions of feminism. Um, some would prefer to talk about uh, a woman's movement rather than feminism, even. And one such group 
were the Kurdish women themselves. They too were against feminism and they wanted to um, talk about a woman's movement. And this was the case until 2013. In 2013, uh, Many important women from the, from the Kurdish movement said, we are feminists. This was the first time that I heard them say that they were feminists. Okay, so um, um, this is just to give you a kind of uh, idea about um, what, how we came together. Uh, but then we also uh, did a lot of... Uh, um, other kind of, um, just to, I, I'm trying to record myself because I usually forget what I say. Uh, um, so, um, more or less, until 2013, we were involved in trying to genderize war. What does it mean to gender war? Um, and uh, we, the, what we did was we had a, we created a space, a place for ourselves with a very important piece of material, a piece of cloth, which is about, uh, uh, about one meter in diameter, a white piece of cloth, which says peace on it. And then there are feminas all over it and sort of kind of graffiti. I, I wanted to, I mean, you have a picture of that piece of cloth in the report that I have sent you. You have a photograph of it. You know what it looks like. Um, and um, we would put it on the ground and we would position ourselves against around it and we would say this is our peace point. So, uh, and we would talk about what war does to women that we want to, uh, this is it, yes. Um, we wanted to put an end to war and we were saying that uh, we, our motto was we are insistent on peace. Barış için ısrar ciz. So um, this, uh, and then we we would every we would react to events that took place by uh, uh, putting together uh, press releases, holding press conferences, uh, trying to. Uh, we went to a group of us went to um, a, a, a high plateau on the Iranian. Iranian Turkish Kurdish border in the province of Hakkari to try and stop uh, sort of insurgents coming uh, from either you know from the south to the north or from the north north to the south. Uh, we spent a night there, a vigil. Uh, you have a photograph of that in the report as well. Um, and uh, we also held a vigil in Taksim Square. At that time, Taksim Square was not closed to. Uh, political protests. Um, and so we did all, you know, we tried, but we, but I mean, the whole thing was that we weren't very, very visible in spite of all this. In 2012, uh, 13, um, in two, two, 2012, there were very important hunger strikes uh, undertaken by Kurdish uh, political prisoners in the prison itself. And the, the hunger strike uh, was stopped on the 63rd or 64th day by Abdullah Öcalan, the imprisoned Kurdish leader. Um, and after that, the Turkish authorities said, we, start, we will start a peace process. Although there had been talks, I mean, you know, I don't want to go into the politics of all this because I'm terribly bored by it. Uh, but th th there was a whole sort of series of, um, uh, okay, this is us in uh, the mountains of uh, Tunceli, Dersim. Um, uh, we, I will talk about that. This is my second paper. Um, okay, so um, so although there had been a lot of um, uh, talks between the Kurdish uh, rebels, the Kurdish combatants, and the uh, Turkish state, various as parts of the security uh, forces, actually, uh, the secret police, the uh, so, th although there had been these things going on, in 2013, the Turkish government declared a peace process, the beginning of a peace process, which made us change our activity from being uh, a genderizing pe uh, war to genderizing peace. Uh, so, um, 
In other words, what we tried to do was to understand peace processes in the world in general and to try and see the extent to which we could make women part of any peace agreement. Okay. Um, so uh, this is the Women's uh, Initiative for Peace and basically what I want to do in this talk is I want to talk about my, our feminist practice and ask uh, the question of whether and to what extent we can, uh, can, uh, we can talk about a feminist epistemic, epistemic project that will bring about peace. Can such a thing uh, really exist or can we think about this? Um, so, um, I don't know how much you know about the, Kurd, the, the war with the Kurds in Turkey. It's a very uh, problematic issue for, re for very important reasons, uh, especially during the 90s. The 90s is a, is, a, is a kind of phrase in Turkish now. It's a symbol. It's a way of talking. It's a way of, of uh, defining a dirty war when the Turkish uh, security forces evacuated more than 5,000 villages. They basically went in said, you, you go, don't take anything with you, just go. And these people, you know, people had to walk out of their lives, um, you know, just like that, at, you know, a point, the point of a gun. And um, there were also many summary executions by paramilitary forces, by state security forces, by clandestine uh, paramilitary forces, all kinds of things. And, um, uh, these, these events were not uh, in any way explained or, under, or uh, reported to the Turkish public. I mean, the Turkish public knew what the Turkish public knew was that there was a group of terrorists, as they were called, who were trying to divide the nation uh, and who were uh, uh, fighting against the, the good uh, Turkish uh, kids who were in the army, that uh, more than 30, 40, 50,000 people were killed. They never mentioned that most of those people who were killed were Kurds, but that's another story. Uh, and um, uh, that uh, we, we were dealing with uh, a group of, of uh, baby killers. I mean, this is how they called the, 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 the uh, leader of the Kurdish political movement. Not that they didn't do atrocities. I'm not saying that they weren't involved in atrocities at all. I mean, that's another question. So, um, so there is so so in the end, what you have is a divided country, a country where a group of people don't know anything about what's happening on the other side of we we, we call it the other side of the Euphrates, the river Euphrates. So we don't know what they happens there. They know exactly what's happening over here because they are part of the state, but uh, we on this side don't know anything about what's happening over there and uh, and then there is this talk, talk about peace and everybody is saying you know what is peace you know these are a group of terrorists and they just have to be massacred they haven't been massacred in 30 years maybe they will be massacred in the 31st year um, okay so this is just background stuff uh, until now so um, what what is the relationship between these events and feminism what is a good feminist like me do, doing with these Kurds, basically? Uh, you know. Um, so um, the first reason of why a good feminist like me is among these Kurds is my first paper, New Face of Honor. Um, like uh, Gibson Graham, I take feminism to be a project of a particular epistemic practice that is fragmented, dispersed, based on the here and now, and produces a politics about subjects and places. Subjects of feminism, subjects of Kurdish feminism, to do away with Kurdish feminism, to talk about feminism in general. You know, these are all sort of various um, developments that uh, we can talk about. Um, and of course, the state of war, which makes Turkey a very security prone, I would like to call it, state. Place. The place that we're talking about is a place of security. So, uh, how can we sort of um, how can we talk about peace where security is the main discourse through which certain things are uh, approached? 
So the first paper, New Piece, New Face of Honor, is a past, is a piece about the deconstructive aspects of feminism. Um, I take their honor to be a doing rather than an essential aspect of a particular culture. It's a doing. Some people can do honor when it suits them. Because I also try to say that um, it is it is um, it is it is something that is done at a particular time and at, at a particular place with a view towards creating hierarchy, with a view towards creating power. In other words, it's an action of power to do honor, to say to someone what you have done is dishonorable, is to uh, say. I am the person who can tell what is honor and what is not honor. I am the, the, the space of power and you are my object here. So, um, um, what I tried to show in that paper by looking at the ways in which um, the Turkish le legal apparatus crimes. I try to understand how this kind of definition is a way of using women as a way of creating an us and them distinction between Kurds and Turks. And that's how I got into this whole business. I mean, that was the whole point. From this notion of why does the Turkish law want to make a distinction between crimes of honor and cost customary crimes? When in Sweden, for example, or in Britain, honor crimes was something that, you know, was a blanket term. Why did the, the Turkish state want to create a, such a distinction? And um, what it turns out to be is that um, it is in this way that the Turkish state can define a Turkish identity, which is uh, seen to be a kind of normative, uh, safe middle ground between two excesses. The excesses of Europe, which has too little family, and the excesses of the Kurds, which, has, which have too much family. Okay, so a just measure of familism is another name I could give to that uh, project. Um, so, uh, so in the construction of a modern Turkish identity, um, you find that the, exist the, the Kurds and the Europeans are necessary to the construction of this identity. Um, and in this article, what I try to do is to uh, put this too much family, too little individuality uh, sort of construct under erasure, which is a term that I uh, take from Derrida. Um, um, and I want to... Uh, to I, to take this representation of tradition as too much family and too little individuality, to put that under erasure, to displace it from its central signifying position, and to relativize it, and thereby undermine it as an explanatory concept. So this is the aim of the payoff. So it's just a small sort of kind of piece as you saw it. So there is no essence to these, um, sorry, to, to um, uh, so, so I want to undermine this kind, this notion of honor as an explanatory concept, which is something which the Western media uses, and you know, whatever, and the Turkish state also uses. Finally, the paper also tries to show how any institution, any practice, any meaning-producing totality is made up of a multitude. In other words, um, there is no essence to Turkish identity, there is no essence to honor, there is no essence to family, there is no essence to honor any of these things. Um, the law of kinship, which is honor, which you can take honor to be, is incorporated into the law of the republic by talking about, um, for example, unjust provocation, using the concept of unjust just provocation, men who perpetrate violence against women are given very light sentences and feminists in Turkey have been fighting against this for a long time now. Um, and uh, the, thus what, ha what is happening is that the notion of honor, which is something that comes from the kinship, uh, from what I call the law of kinship, okay, 
the concept of honor is reincorporated, redefined uh, to fit a kind of modernist individualist frame and to, uh, to uh, give it a particular uh, place in the laws of the modern Turkish state so that men are, uh, under, they are people who are understood, they are, they are you know, they are um, excused, ultimately, excused for uh, being violent towards women. And all of this is used to produce a singular national, modern national identity. Whereas what I'm trying to show is how all this is a kind of multitude of, of, of different uh, traditions, different discourses, different laws, etc., etc. So, uh, like life itself, in other words, nothing is pure. There's a balance between different discourses, practices, and habituses. So this is what I want to speak to, to my first paper, and I would like to hear your comments. So, we have... Hola. We have now, like, uh, five, 20 minutes uh, till the next presentation of the paper, so... Uh, yes, questions? Hi, um, I was just wondering if you can um, open it, it a little bit in your last sentence, if you can um, comment a little bit on what you mean by, um, you know, people are given light sentences for honor crimes, of course, I mean, they, where they shouldn't have, but um, how it is used to create a national identity. Thank you. Maybe we collect three? Yes. Felipe, you want? Hi, uh, thanks a lot for the exposition. Very interesting, the feminist movement, not only the women's movement, uh, and this, the emergence of the identity of the movement. I'd like to, to, to ask you a bit, of, I'm very interested in, in, in the problem of these other violences, especially in the situation of war. If you could explain more this, what are these other violences, how do you concept of, the other violences, the not, not, the other violence, not not only killing, you know, but but beyond that, this epistemic violence. I don't know how how you work with this other object, and and then uh, looking to the future, what are the possible reparations that are imagined that let's say towards a common new way to live together. This might be a uh, long question. You might maybe want to explain it later on, but I was interested to hear more about why uh, Kurdish uh, uh, women in the movement first wanted to distance themselves from the label of feminism and offered the name women, and then uh, shifted the position and kind of reclaimed feminism, like the history of that and the shifts of that. Yeah. Okay. Um, national identity and light sentences. That's a good question. Uh, I mean, all of them are good questions. Um, the thing is that uh, in Europe, Turks are understood to be part of this kind of barbarian past or barbarian sort of uh, Muslim barbarian uh, sort of non-civilized horde that has, you know, uh, uh, forced the gates of Vienna. <laughs> now, um, so what the, the, the response to this is, um, and this is what the paper ex tries to explain, is if we have honor crimes in Turkey, that is not because we are, we have too much family, that we don't have enough individuality, but because like you, like you have your crimes of passion, we too can be um, motivated by 
a kind of loss of reason at a small moment when we see that our women, and here you see the past, and our, the notion of our women is not peculiar to Turkey. I mean, you have crimes of passion all over. I mean, crimes of passion is something which is, for example, recognized in English law, as far as I know. And, um, and um, so when a man perpetrates violence against a woman, it's not because he is a barbarian, but because he has, like any European man, lost his reason. And that is part of modern Turkish identity. We are modern. We are like, we are even better than Europeans, because we have a just measure of the family. Whereas you have lost it all, all your daughters are pregnant at the age of 15, you know, I mean, everybody is on drugs, and you know, so, I mean, this, is, this, is, this is the representation that the state puts forward. And the Turkish sort of, that's why light sentences on men end up by being a way of saying that, you know, we are modern. Is, does that make sense? I mean, I know it doesn't make sense, ultimately, that, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know. But, I mean, that is, that is, the, that is the, the, the kind of the, the thinking behind this. So, um, it's a way of saying, you're looking for barbarians, look at the Kurds. Nah, they are the barbarians. We are not, we are modern. We are a modern, we have, um, we're different than you are. We are, we have our own mores and our own um, morality and our ethics. And the most important thing is the importance of the family. This is the, uh, this government, the, the AKP government. Uh, but the other, the, the less religious people also shared this notion to a much lighter extent. So it is not necessarily simply the AKP. Um, yes, so, um, so it is part of building this kind of modern Turkish state, a Turkish state which uh, can compete with, uh, the, with Europe on any basis. We don't need to ask for favors from Europe anymore. We, our economy is fine, our this is fine. This was the, this was the um, I wrote this paper in 2006 or something like that, which was like the epitome, the, the pinnacle of uh, self-confidence of this AKP government. And that was that. Okay. Um, other violences and war and the reparations that uh, can be imagined. Um, Yes, there are many, many violences in war. Um, I mean, a lot, a, a lot of people talk about the rape of women and uh, I mean, as, as a kind of violence, uh, violence against women in war, but that's not the whole thing. Um, a lot of the peace, uh, truth and reconciliation committees, for example, in South Africa, wanted to concentrate on uh, sexual violence. Uh, against women uh, because they thought that, that was the kind of real violence. Whereas there's a particular um, piece, uh, a, a, a paper written by um, a South African activist, wonderful paper, where she says, where she shows how the women who came to um, uh, talk before the Truth and Reconciliation Committee wanted to show themselves as active agents involved in resisting the South African police rather than victims who had suffered, you know, sexual violence. Yes, of course, yes, there was that, you know. But look, this is what we did. I protected my child like this, I did. So uh, another violence, if you like, is the violence of not recognizing the uh, actual political involvement of women in resistance movements in all kinds of different ways, just constructing women as victims. Uh, which is what the Turkish state has done uh, during or around the 20, 2013 peace process. The sl their slogan was, uh, mothers shouldn't cry anymore. Okay? So understanding women as mothers, whereas women are not just mothers. Um, then, of course, there is the violence of forced migration, which is an incredible, I mean, unimaginable, form of violence. Uh, you come to, a, to people's village, 
you kill a few, few people whose child, whose husband, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, and then you tell them that they have to move. They leave everything behind. They leave their territory, their lands, their houses, their possessions. They leave their identities. An identity, I don't mean as identity as Kurdish, but identity as, for example, of a belonging to a particular tribe, to a particular family, well known in a particular environment, uh, understood as being X or Y or Z in that particular environment. And then identity as a mother, a father, a son, a daughter, you know, all of these being the, the, the what identity means. And then coming to, um, being being uh, propelled, you know, being being flung to an urban area in uh, Turkey, where Diyarbakir, Adana, Mersin, Istanbul, Izmir, Ankara, Bursa. I don't know. I mean, all these different. And what do they become in those places? Kurds, just Kurds. All of those identities get, um, you know, uh, reduced, completely wiped out. And then they have, uh, they leave all kinds of knowledge behind. I mean, how do you, how do you put together a life? You know, you herd animals, you graze, you you uh, cultivate land. All of this knowledge becomes completely, uh, you know, unnecessary, un unimportant. And then language. A lot of these people didn't even speak uh, Turkish, so you do, you become even dumb and deaf. Stupid. And then uh, women would hang clothes. I mean, this is something that I saw actually, you know. They would hang clothes on their balconies, and somebody would say, Look at them, they don't know how to hang, you know, we don't hang clothes like this, you know. So even something like washing, wash, doing the washing, becomes something that you have to learn again. No skill remains, nothing. So what does it mean to build a life from scratch? This is, this is such a huge violence that I don't even know how to talk about it. We in the Women's Initiative for Peace, we have a truth commission. One of the members of the truth commission has just arrived. I see her in that corner, uh, Feza. And, uh, and Jansu is also in that commission. What we're trying to do is we're trying to put together a kind of very simple kind of list of all these violences, <laughs> which is more or less impossible. Uh, we have a truth commission to ourselves, in other words. And, um, and, there, and your, your uh, reparations, uh, how are reparations imagined? Imagined by who? by the Turkish state or by the Kurdish movement. They are two different, very two different modes. The Kurdish movement, I will talk about that a little bit more. The Kurdish movement um, is talking about a rebuilding of life, total rebuilding of life. The Turkish state is talking about a kind of reparations policy. If you, you can go back to your village, if the state paramilitary uh, groups have not occupied it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can claim a form of re uh, reparation from the state if your fields have been burned, uh, but you have to document it and you have, it's a whole process. And many people, there are so many caveats in the way the law has been uh, promulgated that uh, many people end up by not being able to receive anything. Um, other forms of reparation. A lot of the acts that were committed against the Kurds during the 90s were illegal acts. They were illegal even by the standards of the Turkish um, um, law of exception because the Kurdish regions in the 90s were under a, a state um, uh, uh, law of exception. Nidr on Olan Salim. Nidr on yeah, it's not. It's it's. There's another word for it, but I forgot. Whatever. Um, um, 
so even the, the laws were, were much more stringent under these, these emergency, the state, the state of emergency, but um, even under, by the, the, these laws, these acts were illegal. And although since 2013 we have been talking about bringing some sort of uh, justice to political crimes committed by uh, the Turkish Armed Forces, none of these, in fact, deal with uh, acts committed against Kurds. There are two very important cases that are going on now, one in Izmir and the other one in uh, Diyarbakir, uh, on, uh, on um, uh, the killing of Kurds without any reason in two different parts of the Kurdish regions and um, uh, both of them are going very slowly and nobody's expecting anything interesting that to, to come out of them. Yeah. One is Lije, the other one is uh, Shunak, Jizre, for those of you who know. Um, so reparations are imagined very differently according to where you stand and very difficult um, okay, why Kurdish women distance themselves from feminism and then reclaim it? They distance themselves from feminism because feminists in Turkey, I mean, how did the Kurdish women understand feminism? By looking at what we were doing, Turkish feminists are, were doing. I don't like to call us Turkish feminists, but um, if you call one group Kurdish feminists, then the other one becomes automatically Kurdish feminists. Okay, I will use east of the Euphrates, west of, this is the way we go around this problem uh, among ourselves. So I will sort of use the same terminology here. Uh, so uh, west of the Euphrates, we are only women. We, we, don't, we, um, we don't work with men. Uh, we have had, some of us have had very difficult experiences working with men in leftist groups, so we have separated ourselves from them, we are totally autonomous from men. We have been around uh, on this side of the Euphrates since more or less the 1980s. Um, I personally have been involved with feminism in Turkey more or less since 1980. Um, and um, we are small groups, we don't take power as it's kind of, as a kind of, uh, totality over there that we need to confront. We work in small groups. We did a lot of uh, consciousness raising uh, at the beginning. Now it's much less. Um, so we have a certain way of doing things, okay? The Kurdish women, east of the Euphrates, um, women work with men. I mean, there are women guerrillas as much as there are men guerrillas. Women who fight, you know, so they don't, do not want to separate themselves from men at all. They share very much the same ideology. They take, at least until recently, and I will talk about that later, they take on the Turkish state. I mean, they, they have a power project. They had a power project, which was the construction of an independent Kurdish state. Um, this project was kind of revised after 1999, where, even before, uh, but in 1999, the leader of the Kurdish uh, movement, uh, Öcalan, was apprehended in Kenya and put, taken under custody. So, uh, so they, they, um, so they distanced themselves from feminism, and they say we are. They, I don't know if that's enough. Uh, okay, when did they reclaim it? They reclaimed it by criticizing us that they were the real feminists and not we. <laughs> and they did this through this concept of genealogy, which I talk in my third paper. See, so it's, a, it's an interesting way of reclaiming feminism. Uh, it's a way of, um, of creating another feminism. And I talk about the problems with that we, west of the Euphrates, have with this kind of feminism at the end of my paper, so I won't go over it. If, if you agree, we can go on with the second paper, and maybe no, the questions you have now come sum up to the, to the end. It's okay for you? So, um, my second paper is a joint production. Feza was also involved in it. Um, 
Um, it's a report on the workings of the peace process in 2013. Uh, so uh, by looking at that, uh, so this is this is feminism in action. Okay. So you must you you. I don't want to talk about what we did. I mean, um, uh, because you have read it, uh, but I want to talk a little bit about our feminism as we practiced it. Um, we have a number of declared and under, undeclared principles. There was a time when we worked towards. I have a very funny document on my computer about the way we work. <laughs> it was called the way we work. Um, so we tried to uh, to sort of verbalize these kind of ethical principles that we worked with, but uh, there's always more to them and less to them. So it's very difficult to actually um, verbalize these uh, principles, and I will try to do this now. Uh, but it won't be, you know, it will also be very insufficient or very, very problematic. But we want to have full participation of everybody in all the projects. In all, pro all projects that we do uh, have to be, uh, have to be involve everybody. Uh, we have to have equal access to all information and we have to build an ethical approach to resources. So, for example, um, we uh, monetary resources. We do not go to NGOs for funding, either Turkish or abroad. Um, not because we are afraid of being project driven, I mean, uh, but because uh, we are working alongside the law, and I will come back to this in my third paper, so uh, hold on to this. Um, um, we're trying to get everyone's consent when we do something. And even if we don't get uh, a consent, we want to get everyone's go ahead, which is, I don't know if other feminist groups also have this. It's yol vermek in Turkish. Um, but um, so some people will say, well, we don't agree. I don't agree with this, but OK, you can go ahead and do it. Okay, so a kind of go-ahead, to give a go-ahead before embarking on any action, such as writing press releases, going on fact-finding missions, whatever we organizing conferences, whatever we do. Uh, we do a lot of communal pooling of goal-oriented expenditures, such as travel, for example, when we go to monitor a particular um, uh, clash or a particular event. Uh, for when uh, we hear, for example, that there's a clash between the Turkish armed forces and either usually the Kurdish civilian population, but that's also a very difficult thing to talk about. You know, when do the Kurds stop being fighters and when do they become civilians? I mean, that you know, a guerrilla war is a guerrilla war, after all. Um, so when we uh, so when we hear about these such kind of clashes, what we want to do, we we want to go. C on situ, and we want to understand what's taking place there before, uh, because the Turkish press will immediately jump in and produce ideological reports or reports that you know are basically you know uh, uh, distorted. Um, so, um, so we we have, or when we organize a conference, or when we organize a kind of. Uh, uh, meal, you know, so all of these are done through pooling of resources. Um, but again, I mean, we have a lot of problems there because even when we pool resources, I mean, take, to, to take a flight from here to Diyarbakir is not very cheap. Um, and we do it usually at the last moment, which means that airfares are very, very expensive at the last moment. And, you know, uh, you pool resources and then, you know, we have to decide who is coming. You know, and uh, and then we have problems because some people who pay the money want to go. You know, problems, problems, problems. But at least there is this kind of uh, attempt. Um, and then uh, the way in which we define our goals uh, to act in the here and now. Um, 
violence against women, the notions of uh, whatever is in the economy that works against women, the political parties, notions of housework, these are all various issue-based organizations that exist within the feminist movement, and ours is a peace group. So most women in all these other groups, in groups that deal with violence against women or with housework or with uh, political parties or with the economy, all of them work more or less in this, uh, uh, in this way and they try to define their goals in a kind of communal way. Um, then there's the eradication of hierarchy based on knowledge, experience, or the labor one performs. I have written this, therefore I have more say in this. You know, we try to get away from this kind of doing work. We try to get away from this kind, we try. Um, so, um, you see, when I sort of try to enumerate these, uh, you see that um, we are kind of close to the way in which Gibson Graham define a politics of possibility in the here and now. Uh, nevertheless, we also have very specific issues to deal with. I mean, we are an action-oriented group. We, are, we founded ourselves in order to act. So um, what we want to do is to incorporate women and their experiences of war in any peace agreement. We, went to, we want to make women an autonomous party to peace negotiations. We want to be at the table, at the negotiating table. Um, just a uh, parenthesis before the election. Uh, Turkey is divided into before the elections, after the elections, <laughs> which is another issue. Uh, before the elections, um, we were able to incorporate, to ha or the Kurdish movement was able to have a woman on the, uh, at the, uh, at, uh, part, uh, as, as a part of the um, group that goes and have and has deliberations with uh, Abdullah Öcalan on in his prison so the way it works is that uh, the Kurdish a, 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 a group of nego Kurdish nego negotiators from the uh, People's uh, Democratic Party goes to the island where Öcalan is imprisoned they talk they deliberate they come back they give this information to the Turkish state, then they go to northern Iraq, and they give that same information to the guerrillas in Kandil. Then they take that information from there, and the information from the Turkish state, and they go to the island and give the uh, report back to the... So they, they do this kind of three-partite kind of um, uh, uh, negotiation uh, round, and now there's a woman who is definitely a representative of the Kurdish women's movement. This is how they called themselves at that time. Uh, now they're calling themselves the Women's, uh, the women's uh, Free Congress, the Free Women's Congress, okay? Uh, as of uh, January 2015. And um, so they have now included this woman into this uh, into this kind of uh, negotiation. Well, these are not. These are just groups who are trying to uh, produce the negotiating table. The negotiating table is still not there, and the, the existence of this woman from the Kurdish women's movement uh, also is also a way of making women part of the negotiating table. So we are involved at this very moment. We are involved in trying to make the presence of this woman to transform the presence of this woman uh, in, in, this, in this kind of uh, uh, mediate, mediators group um, to be a representative of all the women's movement in Turkey. Not just the Kurdish women's movement, not just feminists, not just this, not... So how can we turn that woman into a representative of all of us so that we women are represented at the negotiating table when and if it's going to exist. Still not there. And during the elections, the whole elections campaigns, etc., etc., the prospects for peace have dimmed very considerably, I have to say. So uh, all of this is a kind of parenthesis. So, uh, so we want to make women auto an autonomous party to push peace negotiations. And 
of course, what hap this means that we need to take decisions and actions in the here and now. Uh, we were, are, therefore working with a sense of urgency, and we feel that there are exigencies that take over our feminist principles of action. We, which, what this means is that we have to make very important compromises. So, instead of the 400 people on the list served, we created a small action group of women. We called it the kitchen, because we're feminists, and took decisions uh, within that group. But the formation of the group was, you know, um, we called everybody, you said, we said, you know, who wants to be in this small group? Who wants to spend more time working for peace than any other uh, thing that they want to do. So uh, we did not appoint people to this position. And then we take decisions and we then let everybody else know, which is an interesting uh, way of doing things. Um, decisions were taken in haste rather than with slow deliberation. Gibson Graham quote, quotes Arjuna Padurai, who says, a politics of patience versus the ty tyranny of emergency. This is exactly what we struggle with every single moment. Um, one of my friends is not talking to me because of this. I mean, you know, there are, it's very, very hard. I mean, this is very, very hard to deal with. Um, uh, we take we take a decision in haste. It's half baked. Then our, you take one decision in haste, and then that leads to other decisions being taken in haste and you suddenly find yourself in a situation where you didn't expect to be, you didn't want to be, etc, etc. Um, so uh, consent and even go ahead was and is difficult to obtain uh, when there are so many diverse definitions of feminism and when there is this sort of exigency like hanging over you like this. Um, voluntarism versus assigning of tasks uh, I, I mean, even there we had to say, you know, we had to like bend arms, yes, yes, you can do it, you can do it, you do this, you do this, you know, pressurizing someone to do something because that thing needed to be done. Uh, and all these, of course, create a very important, you know, uh, wounds in our feminism. I mean, we, we live this as a kind of wounding. Uh, a very serious, another very serious problem, the language of feminism versus the language of the bureaucracy. Our report, which you have, is very much part of this problem because we um, tried to, uh, we, we were addressing in that report uh, the parliament, we were addressing the women in the um, uh, Kurdish fighting forces, the guerrilla women. We were. Uh, we want to. Uh, we want NGOs to read it. We want uh, people for, who are outside Turkey to read it so that they can understand what's going on. So uh, we thought that we had to have a language which was a language of authority, which is not the language of feminism. The language of feminism is a language of. Uh, feelings. It's a language which is much more tentative. It's a language which does not assert itself in this way. Um, or at least this is the way some of us define the language of feminism. Let's put it that way. I did not agree like you. Um, uh, uh, so the report in that sense, if you look at the language of the report, it's a compromise between you know those different languages. Um, and it's uh, it's distributed. It's so please, you know, I sent that report by you know it intentionally disseminated as much as possible wherever you go, wherever you are, and let everybody read it. You know, it's um, it's it's important for for us to see this to to for this to to go to um, as uh, wide an audience as possible. Uh, and then, of course, there's the academic versus the activist language, which had to be kept in balance. Um, for example, we, we did, a, we had, um, um, we did a sit-in in Tunnel, in sort of it's the end of it's the end of the Istiklal Road in Taksim, uh, where uh, at simultaneously we held vigils for Gaza for Rojava and for um, um, Shengal, Sinjar, the Ezidi people who were massacred by Daesh, by ISIL. Okay? So we held a vigil for all these three situations where women 
were involved in war and this vigil was done simultaneously in 20 provinces in Turkey and we were able to link via Skype to all of them and have these conversations. You are here, we are here, you know, so it was a way of bringing up or a way of, of making visible uh, the plight of women and not different and sort of uh, one of those things was that in Turkey um, the mid in the west of the Euphrates the Middle East is far away in the east of the Euphrates the Middle East is there it is the Middle East so uh, what we were trying to do is to bring the Middle East to the west of the Euphrates as well and um, we had many disagreements you know I mean this is an academic thing you know this is people like me talking and then activists were saying you know why are we, why are we doing this so there were wh whenever you we we made a decision about doing something we always had these distinctions with these kind of arguments but we never did anything without arguing without uh, you know whatever our haste we never did something which everybody didn't agree upon everybody in the kitchen didn't agree upon at any rate I mean I have to say this I don't know phase I will maybe say something about this so, um, although we said we, although for example we said we were autonomous from the state, that we weren't going to demand anything from the state, that we would ad address uh, the people, um, our efforts to have women incorporated in the peace process, the report we wrote, necessarily addresses positions of power. So, but even there, we try to address only women, the women, whether they are the women of the parliament, or whether they are women of uh, the guerrilla. So Feza was in the uh, in one of the committees that went to talk to women in the parliament. I was in one of the um, uh, in the group that went to talk to the women uh, guerrillas. So uh, even there, we tried to sort of talk to the women of the uh, fighting parties. Okay, 15 minutes, so. Thank you very much for an uh, extremely interesting <laughs> and engaging discussion. Um, you said, I'm kind of linking the two presentations a bit. You said, um, and I fully agree with you, you criticized the um, kind of rhetoric from the Turkish state and saying, if I tell you you're doing something dishonorable, which they do, then that puts me in the position of power, defines honor and you as dishonorable. And I fully agree with you and I would criticize it too. Um, if you tell me you're doing something that is anti-feminist, does that put you in a position of power? I think it does. And What's wrong with that? In short, uh, I think what you're grappling with and I'm grappling with and I think everybody's grappling with this politics of patience ver versus the tyranny of emergency. Why is it so difficult for women, and we're all struggling, I'm struggling, to get over and beyond that and just accept that when there is an emergency or which is actually in the everyday, um, one needs to vest a position of power, maybe do it differently, but this is precisely what the Kurdish women did to you. They told you, you're not good feminists because we are saying so. And they, by doing so, they put themselves in a position of power vis-a-vis -vis yourselves. And you kind of couldn't criticize them the same way as you did to the Turkish state because they were, you know, comrade souls, etc. But isn't that the only way one can actually do something in the, in the face of emergency? I'll give you a very much more mundane, but every day, and I'm sure each one of us can give us examples of a, a, a personal kind of anecdote that I'm, I'm editing a journal. And we all know when we receive reviews from uh, articles we submitted, we are horrified and they're usually horrible, okay? So one of the first things I tried to do is to redraft all the letters send, I send out to rejected authors so that they are nice, yeah? 
that was the feminine, you know, that was the woman in me. So I, I spent weeks redrafting everything. I spent each crafting every letter. You know what the result was? 50%, I'm not, 50% of the rejected authors were getting back to me saying, oh, maybe you should reconsider. Uh, you rejected me. Why did you reject me? So the moment, I, it was a year after I was editor, the moment I, I'd redrafted the letters, I suddenly get a flood of people questioning my authority. It's because people have learned to only listen to you if you speak the language of authority, and this is the difficulty. Otherwise, you're just not heard. And then we're criticized, we speak the language of authority. And yet, you're, and you're not a good feminist person. So grappling with this, I know I, I heard you say you're grappling with this, but I think it's very important to bring this to the everyday. It's not just in war situations. It's, not, it's in the everyday, and that's where the battle is fought. What do we do then? Anyone else? Well, n maybe not a question, but um, a comment. Um, reading the report and then listening to you, it seems that this group uh, makes visits to lots of diverse governmental, non-governmental, movement-related women uh, groups. And uh, I don't know, I was thinking there's something else in this um, political labor. It's like you're uh, weaving something, or it's, it's not uh, like, uh, I don't know, often the, the discussions uh, take place uh, in terms of uh, representative uh, politics versus direct politics. Uh, this is both representative and direct, uh, but at the same time, in entering into each group, you're trying to generate a debate. So it's, it just seemed as a form of doing politics. It's also point, it's pointing to a different kind of travel, almost like a traveling, um, yeah, weaving, I don't know, um, how to put it exactly. Just one uh, simple question, but uh, it, it had um, a great repercussion. I've asked that to the Kurdish leader that was here. And so it's about the image of women carrying weapons. Because we know that that's a form of, of, of how the domination, male domination, like, it was produced in different societies, like having access of, uh, to, 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 to weapons. How, how it was perceived by the, the feminist movement, these fantastic images. Huh? <laughs> okay. Um, okay, I'll start. Thank you very much for that comment. I mean, they're, they're, it's a wonderful comment. Um, that was exactly my position, I mean, <laughs> as you can imagine. <laughs> um, and you see, being an activist and an ac academic at the same time makes, made, made me uh, come out very strongly on the side of a language of power in this report. And um, one of our friends, one of, the, one of the people who were very much influential in writing this report, who is also a professor in the sociology department, we are a weird group of people in the sociology department, um, Nazan Üstünda, for those who know her, she had done a fact-finding mission in Argentina uh, to see how the uh, Argentinian peace movements had uh, uh, proceeded to come up with the uh, truth about uh, the disappeared and all, uh, you know, what was happening in Argentina. And one of the points that she was making very strongly in her report was how important it was to look scientific. That, you know, that you ha if you had an Excel file or if you had, you know, if you had numbers, then that would be 
uh, serious, considered to be serious and to be considered to be important and scientific. And that's exactly what we tried to replicate in that, because we were saying, you know, this is, we have to be able to speak from science so that we could, we are able to be heard. And we have to, not only that, but this is going to towards something which I will say in the third section, in the third piece that I sent you, but um, th that position is the only position which will keep us, that will provide us a space to speak from. Otherwise, we shall be hammered by the state or by the Kurdish movement. It doesn't, you know, both, we, uh, which, which we have been, you know, we have been faced with that for, uh, for very, for very long time, yes. So yes, I mean, for, and, and it is an every, every day in the sense that you see, yes, it is about war, but our position is, about, is an everyday position. In the sense that we take a position against what's happening in the here and now. In other words, the Turkish state is uh, saying, do, doing one thing. Uh, for example, let me, let, give me, let, let me give you an example. Uh, we heard that uh, the Turkish state was allowing the Daesh, uh, the ISIS people to move across the Turkish border freely. And this was just at a time when a religious holiday was coming around. And it was a time when ISIS uh, really came upon Kobane and they said we are going to have our uh, religious uh, festival in Kobane. This was uh, in early October 2014. And what we did was we put together three buses, three buses full of women uh, saying, you know, this is not a holiday. And we went to the border and we tried to bring, you, we, tried to, we, we tried to sort of construct a human shield. Everybody was constructing it anyway. I mean, it wasn't just us. But we were there and we did it. And um, so it was an everyday decision taken against a particular issue. So yes, it, all decisions that you take are everyday decisions. And they are all, I mean, whether they're about war or whether they're about the family or whether they're about the economy, doesn't really matter. But when you're involved in this, in living, which is what you're saying, I hear you, uh, that's exactly it, yes. So um, we have to listen to, um, but on the other hand, we have to take a position of irony towards our voice of, which is, yes, so I won't go, ahead, you know. So we, we don't have, we should also not take ourselves seriously, you know. Uh, so yes, exactly. Um, a weaving of something, it's so nice the way you put it, you know, a traveling feminism, a weaving feminism. Uh, um, Representative, representative politics and direct politics at the same time. Um, we, we are talking about building um, networks. I mean, yes, we, we are trying to build networks. We are trying to uh, involve, we have tried to involve all kinds of political groups from more sort of social democratic positions to more conservative positions in Turkey. We have tried to involve them uh, in, in, in our movement. Uh, touching them in different ways, going towards them. Go. In other words, we have traveled. I mean, I, it's a very good way of putting it. I really uh, appreciate that point a lot. Um, it's a form of direct politics because um, in 2013, after the Turkish uh, government, did, well, after the government declared the uh, a state of the peace process. We said we're going to build our own peace. We're going to, we're, they will not take women seriously. We know that. We are going to build a women's peace. So we're going to work in a parallel way. This is the way we use, now we cannot use that word anymore. People will not understand, you know, non-Turkish people will not understand this particular reference, but the Turkish government has created this kind of uh, parallel government within itself kind of monster that it's fighting against. And therefore the word parallel is t totally taken over by, by, the, uh, by the government and we cannot use it anymore. But we, we had, so um, we, we, weren't we weren't representatives, we were just 
taking direct action, but then we were trying to get as many women involved within us, and we were trying to make ourselves representatives of, by every year, this t when this time around comes in, in June, we have a conference. We invite everybody and then we become the repre the kitchen becomes the representatives of everybody. Yes, so we have, we, we try to do this kind of, both at the same time. Uh, the women, image of Kurds carrying weapons. The, uh, one of our feminist groups in Turkey has produced, they, they produce a journal called Feminist Politica, which I write in uh, as well. Uh, it's a whole issue devoted to the image of, you know, not the image, but the presence of uh, women in a fighting army. It's a very controversial issue. Um, the first article in the issue begins, you know, uh, anti, we are anti feminism is anti militarist, therefore women should not hold weapons. Then there is the middle position, which is me as you can imagine, which says, you know, yes, sometimes anti-militarism is not a good term, you know, uh, the, the, you know, this kind of in, in a dithering position. And then there is the final position, which, as you can imagine, is Nazan's, and she says, you know, a weapon suits well a woman's hand. <laughs> so, I mean, there are all these. But I want to tell, to give you one little story about this. Um, in uh, uh, June 2014, July 2014, uh, ISIS f attacked Kobani for the first time, and then it attacked again in uh, October. But when it attacked Kobani at the first time, we went we went to the border again uh, to kind of monitor. And then it was also this was also the time when uh, two kids from a town in in a place called Lije had been killed by state security forces because they were protesting against the building of a dam and the building of uh, uh, security um, uh, outposts of the Turkish army. They were killed by security forces. And so we went to see, again, to monitor, to, see, to talk about what had happened, etc. And um, uh, when we were there, one of the people said, uh, we have we just we have a, a cemetery of guerrillas. Do you want to go and see it? In the mountains, the guerrillas build a cemetery. I mean, there are lots of guerrillas who have been killed in those areas. So they they have their own cemeteries, and those cemeteries become a kind of claim to space. I mean, there's you know there's a whole discussion about those cemeteries that can take place. Of course, there it's against the Turkish state. That I mean, there's a whole. So we went to see the cemetery, and when we were in the cemetery, two women guerrillas actually came to visit the cemetery. And as we were talking to them, a woman came, a peasant woman came with her, her you know, and she said she was suffering violence from uh, her husband. And the woman, the guerrilla woman turned towards her and she said, look, if your husband raises his hand against you, you hit back. But you hit back, not just as a reflex. Let it, let your hit, let your strike be a deliberate action. An action that you are totally sort of behind. The whole of your body, your soul, your head should be in that action. And don't forget that a whole army of women with guns are behind you. <laughs> And the woman left with her eyes, you know, sparkling. <laughs> so, <laughs> dither, dither, dither. <laughs> okay, we uh, will do a break now until 11.30, okay? Thank you. <laughs> okay, so good morning uh, to all. Welcome to this uh, fifth day of the Entitled Summer School and uh, orig the, in the original plan, as you all know, we had also uh, Catherine Gibson, uh, but um, uh, she's sending her uh, sincere apologies. She has her mother uh, hospitalized, uh, her 94 years old mother hospitalized, and she has to uh, take care of her. And uh, so she also had to cancel her 
video conference. Uh, but luckily, we have here uh, two very uh, good colleagues of uh, mine, uh, Ceren Özselçuk and uh, Nüket Sirman from the Department of Sociology here at Boğaziçi University. Uh, I was a student of Nüket Sirman some 18 years ago. Uh, <laughs> so I'm very... <laughs> Uh, and I'm very glad that uh, we have them here with us and I'm sure we will have a very good uh, discussion. So the uh, theme of the day uh, is feminist perspective and transformative politics in Turkey. Uh, and uh, what we will uh, try to do is, so I will just tell you about the plan for the session. Uh, we will have Nuket first presenting a bit uh, her first paper and uh, then uh, we will have a general discussion. This is why we have this uh, like kind of organization with the chairs. And then she will also present the second paper of hers and then another discussion hopefully uh, we'll have. Uh, um, and uh, she has also been a feminist activist since 1980 and has edited and published in non-academic feminist journals such as Amagri, Feminist Politica and Feminist Yaklaşımlar. She has also been part of the Women's in Initiative for Peace since 2009 and since 2013 participating, participated in monitoring the progress of the peace process in Turkey. So, uh, thanks for being with us today, and uh, the floor is yours, Nuket Hoca. Uh, thank you very much, Lidia. Do I need that? I think so, yes, because we have this video recording. Oh, okay. First of all, I would like to apologize for coming at this late time of the um, of, of the workshop, uh, but this is the end of term, and I have many administrative duties. Uh, therefore, I had to be, you know, I had to, f to, you know, go to meetings and, you know, do horrible things, and uh, uh, and uh, I couldn't be here. I'm very, very sorry about this because there were some very important piece, um, you know, discussions that I would like, I would have liked to be part of. Uh, so uh, I apologize uh, for this. Um, okay, so as, as J uh, Begum said. I'm a feminist anthropologist and an activist, and in Turkey we have very interesting discussions about what it means to be an activist and what it means to be an academic. Uh, and I'm trying to sort of kind of bridge the two. Um, and uh, since 2009, I've been um, I mean, I, I've been part of this Women's Initiative for Peace. Take it necessarily as simply a political act trying to stop the Kurdish movement, but we saw it as a way of um, keeping, uh, trying to keep um, sort of Kurdish society in the state that it was, uh, the Turkish state or the Turkish sort of general ideology uh, stance defined the Kurds as backwards, barbarians, tribal kind of uh, people, etc., uh, etc. Et so. Um, so we came together to say that um, this uh, kind of action was an act of war, that acts of war were not simply uh, done with uh, weapons or with, with actual sort of firearms, but that there were other ways of fighting against a particular group of persons, an, a, a way of life, a way of being. And um, we, we, uh, we, so we wanted to understand the uh, parts, the, the bits about war that does not get talked about. Uh, the bits about war that have to do with um, uh, life, culture, thought, emotions, affect, you know, all these things. So um, we sent out a, 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 a kind of call to women uh, from the general sort of opposition, leftist groups, and you know, sort of various opposition groups, and said uh, we have ha we are having a forum in Diyarbakir, which is like the uh, capital of the Kurdish regions, or this is how the Kurds <laughs> think about it, and. Um, and many women came. In fact, we ended up with a listserv of 400 
people. And then we'll have the coffee break. Then Jaren uh, will be presenting basically what uh, they have been doing uh, with Catherine Gibson. So it is more like uh, a research agenda based on uh, Gibson's uh, work, but also uh, like kind of uh, 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 future uh, research agenda. Uh, and then we will have the third paper uh, and a discussion again with Nuket uh, Sirman. So let me first introduce you, Jeran. Uh, uh, Jeran uh, is an assistant professor of sociology here at Boğaziçi University in, in Istanbul, and uh, her research fields include post Althusserian theories of political and political economy. Uh, psychoanalysis and subjectivity. Uh, she is a member of the editorial board of the journal Rethinking Marxism, where she has also worked as a managerial editor since 2012. And uh, she is currently working together with Yahya Madra on a book manuscript titled, uh, titled Sexuating Class, a Psychoanalytical Critique of Political Economy. And uh, Professor Nuket Sirman, uh, Nuket Sirman is a professor of anthropology uh, here at the Department of Sociology. She has conducted research on family farms producing cotton in the west of Turkey, on the rise of the feminist movement in Turkey in the early 1980s, on the construction of gendered citizens at the turn of the 20th century, on honor crimes and suicides in Diyarbakır in 2007, and on building a life after forced migration in Mersin in 2000s. Um, there is one more person here, she's hiding behind somewhere there, Jansu, who's also part of the Women's Initiative for Peace. I thought there would be somebody else here from, from our group, but she, she's not here. Um, we came together because in 2009, the Turkish state uh, security forces began to uh, take under custody uh, numerous Kurdish women activists who had been working in um, Kurdish uh, towns and also in Istanbul where there are lots of Kurdish immigrants, uh, forced migrants actually, um, uh, and where there is quite a lot of um, so violence against women. And uh, the women's movement of the Kurdish political movement is a very active, very important group. Uh, uh, I mean, then they are kind of they were at that time in 2009 they were totally they were semi-autonomous from the Kurdish movement as of 2015 January they're completely autonomous from the Kurdish political movement but in terms of their ideology and in terms of their um, sort of uh, general perspectives they are part of the movement obviously uh, so these women were working to empower Kurdish women and they were taken under custody. And that kind of sprang us into action because many of us had been working with them, trying to deal with issues on honor and trying to sort of work on notions of um, uh, crime against women, honor crimes, you know, this uh, type of thing. So. Um, so we, uh, we, uh, we thought that this was a kind of action against the empowerment of Kurdish women. I mean, we did 